morning, everybody. This is Sunday, August 9th, and this is The Journey Online. Well, last week we had our first physical gathering since March. It was amazing. It was a huge success. We are going to do it again. Every other week we're going to be at Masonic Park, just on the other side of Devola. It's kind of tricky to find, but not that bad, but it's the perfect place to meet right now because we have a big open field to hold our service. And man, we had the perfect weather. My biggest fear was that we were gonna be out there in the heat and it was just gonna to be too hot to do it. But we had a 72 degree day with an overcast and a breeze. It was glorious. Uh, but we're gonna be out there again next week. And again, we're gonna go every other week through September. So that would be, or, or I'm sorry, through August and September. And so next Sunday, the 16th, and then the 30th, we'll be at Masonic Park again. And then in September, we're gonna be there the 13th and the 27th. Now, during this time, we're still gonna be online every single Sunday. And so if you can't make it, if you're unable to attend or just not ready or just not comfortable, we're still gonna be online just like this, just like we've been doing since March. But I can tell you that this is such a great place to spread out. This, I mean, the, the size of this field is like two football fields and, and we can bring our own lawn chairs and spread out and be really far away from one another, wear masks when we are gonna be in the vicinity of someone else. It's a really safe and great place to meet. So what I, I would encourage you to be a part of that as we go forward these next couple of months. But if you can't, we're still gonna be here online. And uh, today we're going to continue in the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 7, and we have a very encouraging passage to study today. I hope that you're challenged, but you're going to need a cup of coffee. This isn't the most exciting part of Hebrews, but it's such an important part when it comes to gaining assurance of salvation, as we're talking about faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So grab your Bible, grab your coffee, and let's get going. Well, maybe you're like me and you grew up in an era of Christianity that was dominated by Christian decisionism. And so what that means is there's an emphasis on deciding. And so evangelicalism in my childhood and in my upbringing was dominated by this tactic. You need to decide to follow Jesus. That's where the emphasis was. And it's often the case that this decision was presented to you in a very um, intense way. Maybe you've heard the, the, the car crash gospel presentation. You know, if you were to leave here and on the way home die in a car crash, do you know where you would go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? So it's pretty intense, right? Because, and they would make that car crash seem very inevitable. So, you know, when the stakes are, are proposed to you like that, people get out of their seats. It works. It's effective because people are looking for security and assurance. And so, so many people, after hearing it presented to them like that, would instantly get out of their seats, go down to the altar, and say whatever they had to to make sure they would end up in heaven later that day. Because, again, they were intimidated. So, they, they said, hey, I do I need to say a prayer like you say it? You just tell me what to say. I'll repeat after you. What, whatever a guy's got to do, I want to do it right now. So one of, the, one of the unfortunate, observable consequences of that Christian tactic is that when Christians, after being converted, maybe in a moment like that, down the road when they went looking for assurance, it's often the case that they went looking for, for another decision. And so the next time they heard that same gospel presentation in those terms, they would go forward again, or they would say the, the sinner's prayer in their mind again. Maybe you're like me, and, and you may have said the sinner's prayer a thousand times in your head. You say it at church, you say it when you get home from church, you, you say it when you think about it, you say it a thousand times just looking for security by making a decision. Or maybe you've seen that person go down to the altar time and time again, saying that sinner's prayer again and again, or rededicating their life to the Lord, or getting baptized for a second or even a third time because they wanted assurance of their salvation. And so while I think there was some good intention be behind 
Christian decisionism, what happened was that it inadvertently caused a false assurance in people because it was rooted in their ability to make a good decision and not rooted in Christ. They, when they looked for assurance, they didn't look to Jesus. They started to think, well, did I decide enough? Was my decision genuine? Did I squeeze hard enough? Did I really mean it enough for it to count? They were looking for quality assurance in their decision-making skills. So why am I bringing this up? Well, Hebrews is teaching about assurance. He's teaching them not to look to their experiences whenever they're looking for assurance. He's teaching them to look to Christ. The book of Hebrews was written to a group of Jewish Christian converts who were lacking that assurance, and they were wavering in their faith, and so they were, they were tempted to go back to their past or, or look for a, an experience that would validate a decision they thought they made. They were looking for security. And so Hebrews, to give them that security, again, he, he doesn't point them to themselves. He doesn't say to them, hey, you need to rededicate your life. You need to recommit to live for Jesus. You need to make another decision. He doesn't do any of that. The way that he promotes assurance in their lives is he says, consider Jesus. Deepen your understanding of who he is and what he's done because he himself is our peace. That is the only place we are gonna, we're going to find assurance because he alone is our refuge. So again, they were, they were tempted to look uh, behind them, over their shoulder, back to what they were. They, they would look to the temple sacrifices. They, they looked to those rituals. They, they looked to the law. They looked to the Levitic priesthood because they were insecure. And what Hebrews is saying is that, no, we have something that is superior to all of that. We have a great high priest in Jesus who was designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And then he, he's going to great lengths to, to explain how that is. And that's good, right? That, that's, that's good that he goes to great lengths to explain how Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek as a high priest and why that matters. I mean, think about the assertions that he's making here in Hebrews. Right out of the gates, he's saying that Jesus is superior to angels. Jesus is superior to Moses. Jesus is superior to the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is superior to Abraham, the patriarch. And now he's saying Jesus is superior to the priesthood of Levi. Those assertions are radical. We have to, we have to appreciate how unthinkable this must have been to them. Well, if you're going to make an assertion that's so radical, then you have some explaining to do, right? That's what, that's what this content is. It's an explanation of these grand assertions. How is this so? Hebrews is the how so. He's helping them put it all together. He's helping them to consider the works of Christ and to put it all together with what they know in the Old Testament to understand how he is our refuge. So here in, in chapter 7, he is continuing this argument. And it's so healthy for us to understand this argument because you and I today, we need the same assurance. We too need to understand the how so. I want to understand these arguments not just so that I can have, you know, greater theological or doctrinal prowess. I, I, I'm not, I don't want to understand these arguments so that I can you know, grandstand my decision to follow Christ on social media or anything like that. That's not the motivation I'm looking for. I want assurance. I want to know I'm saved. I want to know that I have salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to draw near to God. Don't you? Don't you want to draw near to God? How do you do that? That's a great thing to think about as we're reading this text today. How do you draw near to God? I know you desire to do that, but how do you do that? This is a great time to reflect and to examine how you do that because how we draw near to God, that will determine how much assurance we have in our hearts. And so Hebrews is giving us those details when it comes to the priesthood of Jesus and when it comes to Melchizedek. He's, he's doing that so that we can have a greater understanding of who he is. And so now he's elaborating on that. He's going even further 
so that they can develop even more assurance. He's going to show and explain the superiority of Jesus and his priesthood over and above everything they hold sacred. So let's, let's consider that. As we read verse 11 in chapter 7, we're actually taking verses 11 through 22 today, but I just want to read verse 11 to get us in to where we were last week. He says, Now if per- perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? So here he, he knows what they hold sacred. He say, he, he's, he's anticipating the problem that they're going to have in their minds with Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He, the only category they would have had at that point in time, unless they remembered everything about Melchizedek, which is unlikely, remember, there's not that much. Every time they would have thought about a priest, they would have thought about a descendant of Levi. So if you're going to tell me Jesus is a high priest, then naturally in the first century they're going to think, oh, okay, well, how's he connected to Levi? So he anticipates the dilemma that thinking about Jesus uh, as a high priest would cause. And so he's getting them to examine the priesthood of Levi. He's saying, let's think about this priesthood of Levi for for a second. And he's trying to show them how it's insufficient. He, He says, let's think about this for a second. How many people do you know who have been perfected by the Levitical priesthood? You know, do you know anybody like that? Well, the answer is obviously no, right? As a matter of fact, if you skipped ahead to chapter 10, verse 4, he talks about uh, the, the sacrifices of bulls and goats. And he says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The, that, those rituals, those sacrifices that were performed by the Levitical priesthood, that's not what saves anyone. The blood of of goats and bulls, that that doesn't atone for anyone's sin. It doesn't take away sin. What that did was it was a reminder of sin. And so every year when they would do those sacrifices, it was a reminder of sins every year, it says. And so he's, he's getting them to consider the priesthood of Levi and the sacrifices that take place there so that he can make the point that, hey, perfection Being reconciled to God, that that requires perfection. That perfection we're after, it's not attainable through the Levitical priesthood because none of those goats and none of those bulls atone for anyone's sins. But the high priest that we have in Jesus after the order of Melchizedek, that does take away your sins. That does atone for your sins. And so he's saying this, what we have in Christ is better than that. This is why another priesthood was necessary because the Levitical priesthood, it was just pointing us towards a need. It didn't actually solve the problem that we have. We need another priesthood. And of course, there is another priesthood mentioned in the Bible. It's a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. He was a priest of the Most High God. And so it was necessary because the Levitical priesthood was not enough. Let's continue in verses 12 through 14. He's anticipating more problems with this argument, and he is addressing them biblically. Verses 12 through 14 says, For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. So again, he's, he's anticipating a perceived problem with Jesus being a priest, and he's addressing it. But he's addressing it biblically. Here's how he's doing it. He's saying, hey, I, I have observed what you've observed about Jesus. Jesus was not a descendant of Levi. He was a descendant of of Judah. And so we know that no one that has descended from Judah has ever been a priest because that's not how it was set up. No no one of that tribe has ever served at the altar at the altar. And so how is this resolved? This is a problem, isn't it? 
They had to be explained these things so they could get over these roadblocks. They had to understand these things biblically if they were gonna get on board. That's the same thing you and I gotta do. When we get to a roadblock or to, a, a, to, to something we don't understand about God or, or about the gospel, we have to dive into scripture to understand these things. Just because we may not understand it doesn't mean it's not true. Maybe it means we need to dig deeper. And that's why we've been given God's word so that we can always be digging deeper. And so that's what he's doing with this argument related to the priestly order of Melchizedek. So if, if Jesus is a descendant of Judah, how can he be a high priest? How is that so? Well, do you remember in the Old Testament, Melchizedek is mentioned twice. He's mentioned in Genesis 14. That's where we get virtually all of the information we have regarding Melchizedek. And we talked about that last week. But do you remember the second place in the Old Testament that Melchizedek is mentioned? It's in Psalm 110. Psalm 110 verse 4 mentions that the future Messiah would be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Psalm 110, that's a messianic psalm. People in Jesus' day would have seen Psalm 110 as a messianic prophecy, something that the, the future Messiah would be, or they'd have to fulfill that prophecy in order to be identified as that Messiah. And Psalm 110 was written in the spirit by King David. And of course, when you look into these Old Testament prophecies, we see that it's a descendant of David that would be this Messiah. And you know who David was a descendant of? Judah. He, David was a descendant of Judah. We know that Jesus was a descendant of David, who was a descendant of Judah. Judah. So again, what does, so, so what, is, what does Psalm 110 say about this future descendant of Judah that would be our Messiah? What does it say about him? When you read in Psalm 110 verse 4, it says this about that future king. God says through King David, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this future king, this future Messiah, according to God, according to Psalm 110 verse 4, would also be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, I know you have these roadblocks, right? So let's solve this biblically. Let's look back into the Old Testament so that we can make sense of how this Messiah, this king, could also be a priest. He's saying it's because it was supposed to be that way. This is exactly what God said this Messiah would be. He would also be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so he's, he's elaborating on that argument and he's explaining to them how Jesus, how the unique life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of, of Psalm 110 and this argument that this Messiah would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let's continue in verses 15 through 17. He says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So here's the logic, right? He's saying, he's saying, hey, look what the Old, Te Old Testament teaches about this future king, this Messiah that we are anticipating. It's saying that he's a descendant of Judah. Well, there's one box checked off for Jesus. He, in fact, is a descendant of Judah, and that's what the prophecy said would be true of the Messiah. What else does it say about this future Messiah? Well, according to Psalm 110, verse 4, it says that this future king, this future Messiah, would also be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, how could, how could this king also be a priest forever? How is that possible? Well, Jesus checks that box too because he lives. He died, but he rose again and ascended into heaven. He lives, he is eternal. He's saying Jesus checks this box because his priesthood never ends. He will be a priest forever by the power of an indestructible life. He conquered death. That's how he alone is the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies concerning the future Messiah. That's why the, the argument about 
the Melchizedek is so important because only Jesus fulfills the prophecy concerning it. So isn't it great that the author of Hebrews, he's trying to witness to these Christian converts and, and sure up their faith. Well, if you're going to do that to a believer in God, you're going to need to use the Bible. If you want to give assurance to another believer, use the Bible. That's how God gives his people assurance. They were, they were tempted to, to look back to rituals and things like that and customs. He said, okay, well, let's look back there. Okay, let's look back there. Let's look at this Old Testament sacred scripture and see what it says. See what it's leading us to. All that you find, all, all the comfort that you find there, it's actually leading us here to where we are with Jesus. He is superior. He is the fulfillment of all of that. It's not that that is bad. It's just that this has been fulfilled in Christ. The comfort that you seek there has brought us here to a superior comfort. Those former things, they've been set aside. We now have a better hope, a better way to draw near to God. That's actually what he says next in verses 18 through 19. He says, For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Now again, it's just so hard for us right now to appreciate how offensive this language would have been, how radical it would have been to their ears to hear. He's saying everything you hold sacred, it's, it's, it's actually weak. It's useless. That's not, that's not its purpose. You're trying to use it for something that it was not purposed for. It's, if you use it the way you're trying to use it, you're proving that it's, uh, you're exposing its weaknesses, if you're using it the way you want to use it, you're actually rendering it useless because it hasn't made anything perfect. So again, this would have blown their minds. And so he's not saying that the law is bad. He's not saying that that's all garbage. He's saying that we've been brought to this point. And so, okay, a great complimentary text to read. This is your homework text. You should go read Romans chapter 7. And so Paul has virtually the same argument at greater length. Go read Romans chapter 7 or, or do what you can do when we're online right now, right? Press pause, get your Bible, and read Romans chapter 7 where Paul has this argument that the law is good, but here's the purpose of the law, all right? The, it, what, what Hebrews is doing right now is he's saying, hey, the law's not bad, it's good, but again, you're trying to use it what it wasn't designed to do. If you're trying to use the law to draw near to God, you're gonna, you think you're going to follow it enough to draw close to God, you're going to be really frustrated because you're going to find the same thing we all keep finding when we go there for that. We keep failing. We're not perfect. We're going to fall on our face time and time again and feel insecure in our faith because we are not perfect. We're not good enough. That's not what it was designed to do. The good and holy purpose of the law is, is not so that we can follow it and be perfect. It was to expose how we are sinful. That's the purpose of the law. It exposes our inability to perfectly follow it. So it doesn't give us hope in that regard because we keep failing to live up to the law. It exposes our need for grace. It exposes our need for the gospel. It's good. And so th that's what the gospel is. It's a promise of grace. It's a promise of grace through Christ. And so if we lose that truth in the gospel, if we lose that truth and we keep trying to, to create experiences or things to, to give ourselves assurance, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to take that Old Testament law mentality we're just going to repackage it and call it Christianity, and we're just going to be right back to square one. And I think that's what happens a lot of time. As a matter of fact, I think many Christians today are actually more comfortable, for some reason, they feel more comfortable with this Old Testament mentality than they do New Covenant life in Christ. And it's, it, <laughs> you're doing yourself such a, a grave injustice when you do that. We don't want to, again, we don't want to repackage the law and call it Christianity. We don't want to create some new external code that we think we have to follow in order to draw near to God. Yet, I think we do it all the time. I think 
sometimes unconsciously, uh, most of the time unconsciously, I think that we, we, we speak this into our own lives and to the lives of other people around us. We, we say, well, hey, if, if I really want to draw near to God, I got to walk this way and I got to talk this way. I got to do this and don't do that. If I could just get my act together, then I'm going to draw near to God. I need to look like this and make sure I don't look like that. That will make me draw near to God. Then I will feel close to him. I need to sing these songs and don't sing those songs. I, I need to be in the cutting edge of ministry in order to feel close. I need, I need to do more of the Christian life in order to draw near to God. Okay, listen, that mentality is legalism. That mentality will steal assurance from you because it's work-centric. It, boi it boils down to this. When, when we try to create these experiences and, and, and force this, this effort to draw near to God, we're basically saying, I, I, I trust in myself to draw near to God over and above trusting God's gospel to draw me near to him. Do you, see, did you, did you see that? You see that fine line that's there? We don't want to trust in ourselves to draw near to God more than we trust God to draw him near to, to him, to draw us near to him. We don't, th there's a really fine line that we fail to see here that robs our assurance. So let me, let me, let me flesh this out a little bit more in, in, in American Christianity, because this is just what I observe, not only in my own life, but in the lives of others around me as I exist in this society. I think a lot of times when people feel distant from God, they say, okay, what, what do I got to do? I know, I'm going to saturate myself in more Christian culture. That'll cause me to draw near to God. I'll draw near to him by utilizing the, 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 Christ, the, the elite of Christian culture. And so how we do this today? Well, what's the, who are the celebrity pastors? That seems to be working. A lot of people like them. A, a lot of people evidently are drawing near to God through that ministry because it's so popular. And so we, we gaze upon these Christian celebrity preachers thinking that will draw us near to God. We do this with cutting edge worship. Maybe I can just gaze upon and take in the best of the best Christian worship, the most popular, the most glamorous, the most sought after uh, music in the Christian culture. If I can just get more of that on my, um, in my iTunes or, or on my car radio, then I'm gonna draw near to God. It, there's a fundamental flaw when this is the way that we think. When we start to think that we need to fill our life with the best experiences Christianity has to offer or cultural Christianity has to offer, we, we're getting it backwards. If, if you think that those efforts are what, gonna, are what are gonna cause you to fuel up for Jesus, you're gonna be very frustrated because what you'll find is that it's never enough. What you'll find is that you keep going back to that well over and over and over again, and it does not satisfy your thirst. It, you'll always be on to the next thing. There will always be something a little bit better that you think will offer you a little more security, and so you'll go striving after that. I think a great, this is kind of how I view American Christianity a lot of times. I think it's, it's like a bustling uh, shopping mall. I think of Christianity sometimes as a shopping mall full of people rushing back and forth looking for the latest brands, trying to look cool. What's in and what's out? What do I got to do to look good and feel good about myself? Where do I got to go? How much do I got to spend? Oh, look, there's a new store. I'm going to go to it. It will give me what I'm looking for here. But what do we find out? Eventually, those clothes wear out. Eventually, they're not cool anymore. So we got to go back to that mall we got to find a new product. we got to find a new store, which is often just the same store repackaged in a new store. <laughs> and the cycle rinses and repeats over and over again. And we start to look like insecure teenage kids trying to look cool for God. Well, the reason why those experiences always disappoint us is this. The law made nothing perfect. The law made nothing perfect. 
Living in the Spirit isn't about scratching some religious itch in your life to make you feel good. That's not living in the Spirit of God according to the Bible. What we see in the Gospel is that living in the Spirit is about fixating your eyes upon who Jesus is and turning to Him in faith for the forgiveness of your sins. That's, that's what faith is. That's what living in the Spirit is according to Scripture. That, the Gospel message, that's what will draw you near to God. It's His Gospel through His Son, Jesus Christ. We think about that song that we grew up singing in church, what can wash away my sins? You could finish the line. What is it? Experiences at a church and conferences. That's not it, is it? No, we strive after those things in order to draw near to God a lot, but that's not what it says. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. Faith, faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ Faith in this high priestly sacrifice, it can do what nothing else can do. It will perfect you. It will make you perfect before a perfect God. It will save you from your sins and make you righteous before him. That's the gospel of grace through Jesus Christ. And the beauty of that is it enables you to live a life that pursues righteousness and we never want to get those things out of order. We don't want to pursue righteousness in order that God will love us. He loves us through his son, Jesus Christ, and that's what causes us to draw near to him, and therefore, we pursue righteousness. There's a fine line there, but there is a monumental difference there. Christianity has nothing to do with creating security through self-preservation. That's not what it is. We have a better hope than that. We don't want to create new rituals to look for security. We don't want to create new things for the, for the sake of feeling good about ourselves. We want to do those things to exalt what we have in Christ. We, we have a better hope than our efforts, and that is, there's a freedom there that we, have, that we get to embrace. We don't want to create a new experience to to preserve ourselves, we have been preserved through Christ. See the difference there. He is our refuge. Now just imagine being a first century Christian, hearing this gospel message and, 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 and seeing that develop in their lives. This would have been such a, a radical change of perspective for them. Yet we today, we need to have that same radical perspective change because we are prone to the same exact error that those first century Christians are doing. He's saying, hey, stop looking for, for security here. We have something superior in our high priest, Jesus. He is the guarantor of our salvation. That's what he says next in, in verses 20 through 22. He says, and it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but, the one, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. That's that Psalm 110 quote. And he says in verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. And so the substance of our faith is not our, not our past. The substance of our faith is not in our decisions. It's not in our experiences. It's not in our ability. The substance of, of our faith is, is just Christ. It's just Jesus. Do you want to draw near to God? A lot of these Christian experiences that we seek after, they're not bad in and of themselves, but we don't want to use them for the wrong purpose. You know, when I gather together with a group of believers and we sing maybe new praise songs or, or we worship or or we go through the liturgy of a service that every church does on a Sunday morning, we do these things to exalt Christ, but that's not where we find our security. Our security is in who Jesus is, not in our efforts. It's not in how we worship or, 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 what, or, or what we're doing in worship. It's, it's in Jesus, the, the substance of our faith. The, the, that, that's the purpose of all these things that we do as a Christian, to exalt Christ, because he alone is our refuge. He's the only place we can look to find assurance. Let's pray. Lord, 
We thank you so much for your word that, help us, that helps us to deepen our understanding of who you are and how we are to live. Lord, it's so often the case that we look into your, your word and, and we, try to t- we try to create a new law today. We want to make a new law that we can follow in order to be right with you. And it's often the case that when we do that, we actually change the rules, we change the law, we create our own law so that we can convince ourselves we're perfect in your eyes. But Lord, we know because of your word, that's not how this works. Lord, you have given us your law to show us that we are sinful. But Lord, you've given us your law so that we can see the amazing grace that we have through your son, Jesus Christ. He alone is our refuge. He alone alone is our hope. He is the substance of our faith. Thank you, Lord, for what we have through your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.